What's cracking, yo? Welcome back to Boo TV. Appreciate you for stopping in. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, stay notified, and let's get into the topic for today. Another player that has been recommended for me to check out as I continue to learn more and brush up on players of the past that I may not know anything about or may know very little about. We have here the great artist Gilmore. Now, I've heard about Artist Gilmore quite a few times, but really never knew a whole lot about him. I know he's a center. I know that he played an extensive part of his career with the Chicago Bulls and is widely considered the greatest center to ever put on a Chicago Bulls uniform. I know that when he came into the league, he was a uh, pretty damn good player, has some all-star seasons and whatnot. Uh, split between the ABA and NBA for his career. Um, could finish at the basket. Pretty damn good rebounder. But outside of that, I really don't know a whole lot about Artis Gilmore, to be honest with you. So I'm glad I found this video. I could check it out. But let's just go over a little bit about Artis Gilmore, his accolades, stature, all that good stuff. So seven foot two, about 240 pounds. Went to Gardner, Webb, uh, and Jacksonville. Was drafted in 1971. Round seven with the 117th overall pick selected by the NBA by the Chicago Bulls, but also selected uh, in the ABA by the Kentucky Colonels. Played from 71 to 1989 uh, through both leagues. Like I said, had a stint with the Kentucky Colonels, Chicago Bulls, San Antonio Spurs. Found his way back to the Chicago Bulls as a role player. And then with the Boston Celtics and I think uh, Overseas League, if I'm not mistaken. Artis Gilmore uh, was an ABA champion in 1975, ABA uh, Most Valuable Player. ABA Most Valuable Player in 1975 and 1972. Oh, wait, so there was an ABA Playoffs Most Valuable Player in 1975 and then just an ABA MVP. 1972, my bad. Six-time NBA All-Star, five-time ABA All-Star, ABA All-Star Game MVP, five-time All-ABA First Team, four-time All-ABA Defensive First Team, NBA All-Defensive -Defense Second Team once, ABA Rookie of the Year, ABA All-Rookie First Team, four-time ABA Rebounding Champion, ABA All-Time Team to name a few. For his career, oh man, he has quite a bit of points. Uh, Artis had 24,941 points for an average of 18.8 .8 points per game. Grabbed 16,330 rebounds for 12.3 rebounds per game. And 3,178 blocks for 2.4 blocks a game. Pretty impressive. And just to talk about how the whole ABA NBA draft thing went. So like I said, Gilmore was drafted by the Kentucky Colonels in 1971. Um, but the NBA teams also wanted Gilmore as well. So, like I said, uh, he ended up signing a 10-year, $2.5 million contract with the Colonels, but strategically, the Chicago Bulls used a seventh-round pick to secure any possible future rights to Gilmore. When Artis got into the league, he was immediately a dominant figure, and he ended up getting ABA Rookie of the Year and ABA most valuable player in the same season, 1971, uh, 1972. Uh, and that was while Julius Irving was also a rookie. So he outplayed Julius Irving. That's incredible. The Colonels finished with a 68 and 16 record after only being 44 and 4 the season before. So you can see the type of impact Artis Gilmore had on this ball club upon joining the squad. In the 74 75 season, is when Artis Gilmore and the Colonels won the N or the ABA championship. As usual, Gilmore was a dominant, prominent figure on on the uh, on the court at any given time, and uh, you know nabbed that MVP award. And then two years after that, or rather the next season, is when the ABA disbanded uh, after 1976, and the Bulls then absorbed Artis Gilmore. In Artis' rookie year with the Chicago Bulls, he averaged an amazing 18.6 points per game, 13 rebounds per game on 66% shooting, uh, percent shooting from the floor, throwing 2.5 blocks. After that season, he would go on to have 22.9 points per game, 13.1 rebounds per game, and 2.2 blocks per game. 
Following that season, he would have his highest scoring season uh, with the Chicago Bulls, 23.7 points per game, 12.7 rebounds per game, and 1.9 blocks per game. After that, the rest of the years, he would go on to average uh, in the teens, the high teens, and was a pretty solid figure up until, mm, say, the 1986-1987 season where his scoring really uh, dipped down to about 11 points per game. But at that point, he was definitely a role player. Now, like I said, that's just me reading off some basic statistics, saying how, you know, his numbers matched up for each year for, for what team. And we expect those numbers, like most players, to go down after age and they settle into a role-playing gig. Uh, but like I said, I don't really know a lot about him, so I'm interested in watching this video and learning everything I can. All right, let's check it out. All right, right let's get into it. described him as the Gulliver among the Lilliputians, a King Kong sitting atop the Empire State Building, not swatting down airplanes, but basketballs. Mm. He had an intimidating appearance, but Artist Gilmore was in reality a gentle giant who rarely showed anger or emotion on the court. Although he was chastised by coaches and fans who wanted him to show more fire, his production was always at an elite level, whether as a scorer, rebounder, or shot blocker. Opposing teams would find him to be the unstoppable. I didn't even mention that in my opening remarks. His He was called the H-Ray, and I'm tripping. I did know that. Shoot the Artist range. Gilmore was born September 21, 1949, in the small town of Chipley, Florida, the second oldest of eight children. His father was a retired landscape worker who stood at five foot five, while Artis's mother was six foot four. Damn. We were poor but lived happily, Gilmore said. But he was growing so fast that his parents had to send him to work at age 10 so that he would have clothes to wear. I did anything anyone wanted me to, Gilmore said. In the summer, I would go to New York and wash dishes to make money. You see, I couldn't get clothes that fit anywhere but in New York. Gilmore grew to be six foot five by his high school freshman year and initially wanted to play football, but his parents couldn't afford insurance. There wasn't an indoor gym at his school, so basketball was played solely on concrete. I was uncoordinated and couldn't play the game, Gilmore said. The coach asked me to come out. I don't think he knew that much about basketball, and he couldn't really help me. Encouraged <laughs> to go to basketball camp the following summer, Gilmore had to work instead, getting a job loading watermelons to help his family with the bills. By his senior year, Gilmore had grown to be seven foot one. His family would move to Dothan, Alabama, where he would enroll at Carver High School. Gilmore had never attended an integrated school before, or had even associated much with the white community. He entered the school feeling anxious. I realized at Carver how little I really knew, Gilmore said, and that I wanted to make something of myself in basketball. Gilmore became the star player of the team. His eye-popping stats garnered attention from recruiters across the nation, but he settled on a small Christian college in Boiling Springs, North Carolina, called Gardner Webb. The soft-spoken young man wanted a quiet place and the small college fit his criteria. The school's basketball coach, Eddie Holbrook, included a seven foot six inch bed for Gilmore, which helped seal the deal. I've always slept on a regular sized bed, Gilmore said, at an X-like angle so my feet wouldn't hang off the end. Mm -hmm. Growing to a height of seven feet and two inches and weighing 240 pounds, Gilmore enrolled for two years at Gardner Webb. But the special bed and mattresses weren't the only special orders he needed. He had to get his clothes through a specialty store in Philadelphia. For shoes, a special order was made through a local sporting goods store as they didn't carry a size 16 and a half. When the team would travel, they would often make a T out of two beds to accommodate him. Still, Gilmore just wanted to be a regular guy. He enjoyed pencil drawings, ping pong, dancing, and soul music. The louder, the better. He also joined the nearby Green Bethel Baptist Church. But wherever he went, he was gawked at because of his size. 
Too many people look at me as if I was just a basketball player, Gilmore said. I want them to think of me as a human being. Holbrook saw Gilmore as still a basketball novice. He put him on a two-year crash course in the fundamentals of the game while helping him bulk up physically with meals of two steaks and a half gallon of milk. He Every became day. an unbelievable shot blocker, Holbrook said. He had the ability to keep the ball inbounds and not just swat it into the stands. Personality-wise, Gilmore remained easygoing, and his coach would often pinch and at one time slap the young player to try and motivate him. But the prodding didn't seem to be necessary in looking at the stats, as Gilmore averaged 24 points and 18 rebounds a game. He has as much God-given talent as Alcindor, Coach Holbrook said, but he's still what you'd call a diamond in the rough. He'll look like a pro for 10 minutes, then you won't see him do a thing for the next 10. <laughs> Gardner-Webb was a two-year school, and Gilmore needed the platform of a four-year school. Pause. You see a lot of players like that. So much raw, raw, raw talent, and it, it seems to, to leak out at times and able to do amazing things, but you can see that it, it's undeveloped, you know? If he wanted to turn pro. If his NBA hoop dreams didn't come true, his backup plan was to go into elementary education. Gilmore wanted out of Boiling Springs, knowing that a larger world was out there waiting. This is such a small town, Gilmore said. I know it's never bothered me before because I knew everyone in Chipley, but there are only five Negro girls in school and that limits your social life and a friend and I have been considering going someplace else ever since we were turned away from a restaurant in South Carolina mm -hmm. on a road trip. Mm -hmm. Gilmore transferred to Jacksonville University, where he would play under coach Joe Williams. Williams became one of the few white men Gilmore trusted, having the player over to dinner and his children's birthday parties. On the court, Gilmore would average 24.3 points and 22.7 rebounds a game, leading the nation in both of his years at Jacksonville. In his final year, he and his teammate Rex Morgan were nicknamed Batman and Robin, becoming the Cinderella story in the NCAA tournament where they would make it all the way to the national championship game to play against the legendary John Wooden and the UCLA Bruins. Gilmore would go heads up against UCLA's six foot eight jumping jack forward Sidney Wicks who would block five of his shots. A new experience for Gilmore. He would be limited to 19 points as his team lost 80 to 69 against the Bruins. Wicks would later admit that if the rules for allowing dunks remained Gilmore would have, quote, killed us. Still, the night of being outplayed by Sidney Wicks left a long impression on Gilmore. It was a nightmare, Gilmore said. Every time I had pretty much forgotten about it, some little kid would come up behind me and shout, Sidney Wicks, as if it's supposed to scare me or something. <laughs> that game was probably the worst I've ever played. Turning pro, Gilmore was expected to be picked up by the lowly Cleveland Cavaliers, who were an expansion team with a previous year record of 15-67. and 67. But a week before the draft, Gilmore opted for the ABA over the NBA as he received a 10-year $2.5 million contract from the Kentucky Colonels, which may have been the most lucrative in all of sports at the time. Gilmore would treat himself to a Cadillac and get his father a new pickup truck. I've always looked forward to having something, Gilmore said. I thought it would change my life, but it hasn't. I'm still the same. He would also buy his parents a three-bedroom, two-bath home in a nice neighborhood in Panama City, Florida. Entering the ABA, fans of opposing teams would not take kindly to the seven-foot-two-inch giant with the three-inch afro. They would call him Goon and scream at him to get a haircut. As his reputation grew, so did the amount of people who approached him in public. He would often be asked how tall he was, and he would always answer six foot five. More often than not, the stranger would be so impressed by his size that they wouldn't process the wrongness of his answer. Some people would pretend to know him on sight, asking, Aren't you, uh, what's his name, Kareem Abdul Jabbar? No, artist would reply. My name is Howard Jenkins. Gilmore would give false answers because sometimes he didn't feel like talking. And if he told them the truth, they'd ask 10 more questions. Uh -huh. Gilmore also thought faking it was fun and he hated being rude. When a woman asked him if he played basketball for a living, Gilmore replied, No, I wash giraffe ears. 
<laughs> Meanwhile, on the court, <laughs> Gilmore was now giving. <laughs> Bro, I could. I'm laughing too, cause I could. I I kind of do stuff like that, that funny sarcasm. That's that's gold. I love it. I love it. That's that's a, uh, that's right out of my book. But I'm taking one right out of Gilmore's book. Given free reign in the ABA, a league which allowed and encouraged the slam dunk. In his rookie season, Gilmore would win the Rookie of the Year and the League MVP award, both over Julius Irving, as he averaged 23.8 points and 17.8 rebounds per game. When he holds the ball away from his opponent, columnist Buddy Martin wrote, it is almost like an adult playing with children. In 1973, Gilmore would lead the Colonels to the ABA Finals but would lose to the Indiana Pacers. Two years later, the Colonels would win the ABA Championship, this time defeating the Pacers, with Gilmore averaging 25 points and 21 rebounds in the series. Mm. It's like biting into something delicious, Gilmore said. You just don't want to stop eating and eating. The championship win silenced Gilmore's critics, at least temporarily. He was pegged as someone who could never play on a championship team because he was too nice. Some writers started calling me gentle then, Gilmore said. But his tenure wouldn't be without physical confrontation, as the normally even-tempered Gilmore would lose his cool three times during his ABA career until a right cross by Maurice Lucas dropped him to his knees. I regret that it happened, Gilmore mumbled with a fat upper lip. I don't want to talk about the fight. I just lost one. That's all. The ABA disbanded prior to the 1976-77 season, and the Kentucky Colonels folded. Gilmore was sent to the NBA Chicago Bulls, who had shrewdly drafted him in the seventh round in the 1971 draft, thereby securing his rights. An all-star during all five years of his tenure in the ABA, Gilmore was thought to be the talent that would lead the Bulls to their promised land. Mm. I want to be the greatest player who ever played the game, Gilmore said. I don't know if I'll ever reach that objective, but I'm not fair to myself or my team if I don't point in that direction. Sixteen games into his first season, the Bulls had only won two. Gilmore was now longing for his winning days with the Kentucky Colonels. It was tough, very tough, Gilmore said. I really didn't get much respect from within the team. My own teammates just didn't have the respect for what I could do. Here all this time, I thought MJ was the first Chicago Bull to rock a chain with a uniform on. Artists out here rocking it in the game, baby. Reporters didn't give him all that much respect either. Columnist Robert Marcus wrote, quote, Watching artist Gilmore play basketball is a little like being served apple pie when you ordered sherry. It may be very good, but it's not what you thought you were getting. The Bulls continued to lose, and Gilmore was made the scapegoat. His impassive nature made the fans and sports writers crazy. Fans in Chicago were making jokes that when the firing squad executed killer Gary Gilmore, they shot the wrong Gilmore. Gilmore himself never complained. If you get too emotionally involved with what's going on around you, Gilmore said, you won't do your job. He go. remained an Ironman in Chicago just like he was in Kentucky, not missing a game and averaging 40 minutes per outing. There were many times when I was sick, Gilmore said, but I still went out there and gave it my best effort. Maybe that effort didn't satisfy the coaches that I was trying my hardest, but they weren't the ones I was trying to satisfy. I wanted to satisfy myself. The Bulls coaching staff eventually realized that Gilmore needed the ball more, he would have his best NBA year in the 1978-79 season, averaging 23.7 points per game, and he would become an all-star in four of his six full seasons with the Bulls. But he would suffer a knee injury in the fourth game of the 1979-80 season, ending what was a long streak of consecutive playing appearances for both the now-defunct Colonels and the Bulls. It was thought that the knee surgery he underwent could possibly end his career. Gilmore was given the option of sitting out the season to work out on his own to strengthen the knee, but he insisted on coming back and working himself into shape. Would I still be able to run up and down the floor, rebound and jump? Gilmore asked. You see, had I not come back, that would have been lingering in my mind during the offseason. Gilmore played 48 games that year, but the Bulls had another dismal season. Despite his bravery in coming back, 
He was blamed for what some perceived to be his lack of intensity. I worked very hard, Gilmore said. Mm. That is the same sort of thing they say about Kareem. They say he's too passive, that he doesn't look like he's working hard. There's some players who are the types who dive across the floor to get loose balls, that sort of thing. But when the game is over, they don't have any stats. Only the player and the coach know what the individual means to the team. Despite his glossy stats, the fans were disgusted with the performance of the Bulls. They often cheered when the PA announcer would declare that only two minutes remained in yet another losing game. Golly. Gilmore would be traded before the start of the 1982-83 season to the San Antonio Spurs. The sports writers in San Antonio weren't any kinder to Gilmore than those in Chicago. Gilmore is 32 years old, one reporter wrote, and he plays much older. But now teamed with George the Iceman Gervin, the duo would lead the team to a first place division finish in the 1982-83 season. They would make it into the Western Conference Finals where they would lose to the Lakers in six games despite a 27 point, 20 rebound, and five block effort by Gilmore mm. in game two. Mm. The Spurs would make the playoffs with Gilmore twice more, but never make it out of the first round. By 1985, he was trying to shake the loser image as even though he won the ABA championship with the Colonels, he really didn't come close in all the years since. People see me as a loser, Gilmore said. There isn't anything that will change that. Nobody likes Goliath. I think I've had a tremendous career, but people don't notice. Gilmore would then rejoin the Bulls for part of the 1988 season. The Bulls reacquired him on draft day in exchange for a second round draft pick, hoping that his rejuvenation in San Antonio would carry over a gamble that the legs and stamina of the now 38 year old could still be effective. The gamble didn't pay off as the homecoming celebration soon turned into a sad farewell. 20 games in, Gilmore only averaged 4.2 and 2.6 rebounds while playing 15 minutes a game. He had difficulty keeping up with players who were now 10 and 15 years younger. After the team suffered a three-game losing streak, Gilmore was given a choice of being released or retiring with an artist Gilmore night in Chicago. He chose to leave without the pomp and circumstance. If I had been on top for the past five years, I think I might want the fanfare when I retired, but I haven't been, Gilmore said. The fans don't owe me any goodbyes. I'll just Honestly, based on what I'm hearing about how he was treated by the Chicago band, uh, Chicago Bulls fans, I felt like they would have had this damn artist Gilmore night. Either nobody was really going to show up or people was going to show up just to boo him and make fun of him and not celebrate his career. So I might have been a good choice there, artist. Just fade away. The Bulls released him and he was then picked up by the Celtics, finishing his NBA career with the team. A stint in the Italian league followed, where he averaged 12 points and 11 rebounds before calling it quits on his basketball career. In April of 2011, Gilmore was elected to the Basketball Hall good, of Fame. Good. I feel a man should have only one goal, and that is to be the very best, Gilmore said. But I don't believe in personal goals, isolated goals which relate to a game or a season. If you do that, and you accomplish those You're a goals... family then I feel you lose some of your incentive. If you reach the top of the mountain, there's no place else to go. So you set your sights on the highest mountain and hope someday you'll reach it. Words from artist Gilmore. Interesting career there. That's that's kind of sad, man, to see how he was uh, how he was kind of treated. But as, as they're talking about, they're saying, see, I, I, I don't know if it's a situation where, you know, some players don't look like they're working hard or look dominant or have the scowling face. But he was still performing well and performing at a high level. I don't know if it was circumstantial. like, Because at one point in the, in the documentary there, they were like, hey, uh, they realized that artist needs to get more touches. Well, all these years before that, was he not getting enough touches? Is that one of the reasons why his production wasn't what people were looking for, even though it was solid, you know? 18, 19, 20, 21 points, over 10 rebounds type of stuff, two two blocks a game type stuff. I mean, seems pretty satisfactory. But I'm also thinking, 
or was it like kind of like the Anthony Davis thing where we see Anthony Davis and we're like this this big guy doesn't assert himself he's not assertive he needs to be more of a leader he needs to demand the basketball he needs to exert his dominance we always talk about Anthony Davis potentially 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 bump potential put it out there every game so was he like the Anthony Davis of his time was it did he have that Anthony Davis mentality or or, or, or was he playing pretty damn good but he just you know did it with a gentle a gentle expression what were the circumstances completely I'm starting to get the feeling he might have been like the Anthony Davis like he had so much more potential but he he often talks about like he just said being the he's was being the best player he could be so if he was squeezing everything out of his orange and that's what we got but it didn't live up it didn't live up to people's standards then I mean it is what it is maybe the expectations were too high And I guess he didn't meet other people's expectations, but I mean, if he if he can honestly say he squeezed everything out of himself, and this was the best version of him, then he can he can rest easy at night knowing that. Anyway, add more context, folks. Y'all know more than me, especially about all this pastime stuff. If you if you can add anything to the story, add anything to some of the parts I'm I'm a bit unclear about. Give me some clarity. Let me know in the comment section, please. Appreciate you guys so much. Be blessed. Take care. And I'll catch you on the next one. Can't stop the A-Train. We out, baby.